Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We are going to discuss the poems of Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, born around 1517 and passed away in 1547. We, whenever we have a C with a dot or a question mark before or after a year, it means about, we do not know the exact date of birth or date of death. So, we mention this point through this use of C that means circa or question mark. We will examine the historical context in which the poet wrote his poems. Similarly, we will look into the literary context in which the poet was able to write his poems. We will have a brief introduction to Henry Howard, usually called the Earl of Surrey or simply Surrey. For the sake of this video, we will analyze two poems. These are sonnets, Elizabethan sonnets or just before Elizabeth, he wrote these sonnets. One is called Love that doth reign and live within my thought. The second sonnet is the suit season that bud and bloom forth brings. We will analyze these poems and then conclude our discussion. Now, let us see the early 16th century. Just before the reign of Queen Elizabeth, there was always a war between England and France. In this war, many dukes, many lords and soldiers participated. The Duke of Norfolk was supporting the king. Our poet Surrey happens to be one of the sons of the Duke of Norfolk. And in this context, the Duke of Norfolk for some reason delayed the attack on the French in a location called Montreal. And this led to some suspicion on the part of the king regarding the motives of the Duke of Norfolk for delaying the attack. Henry Howard also participated in the war and at one point of time he got wounded. He was saved by his friend Thomas Claret. And after some time when there was a suspicion due to political uh, problems in the country, Surrey was executed at the age of 30 on charge of treason by Henry the Eighth. Now, let us examine literary context. Surrey was a contemporary of Sir Thomas Wyatt who influenced Surrey profoundly. Surrey was junior to Wyatt by 14 years, but then he took more interest in translation of writings from the Italian literature. It was a common phenomenon of that day and the translations varied according to the level of closeness with the original. Some poets simply imitated, some others freely translated some others went ahead with full imitation of the writers. These poems translated and some original, some of these sonnets and other songs and other poems were collected in an anthology called Tottel's Miscellany, which was published in 1557. This publication ushered a new taste in poetry in England. At that time, 
there was a native tradition of poetry led by a well known poet of that time John Skelton, but this kind of native tradition went out of fashion when the fresh air of poetry came from Latin and other writings from the continent. The Earl of Surrey is called the first English classical poet by the historian Thomas Watton in his book A History of English Poetry. The reason is Surrey took more interest in classical writings particularly that of Virgil. Surrey translated Virgil's epic Aeneid, two books actually he translated into English. For his translation Surrey brought in a new experiment into English poetry that is he used blank verse as an equal to the Latin unrhymed hexameter. This particular innovation in English poetry has led to a great deal of new poetry in English for the rest of many years, many centuries. Sari also developed the sonnet of three quatrains and a couplet structure. This is called the Shakespearean sonnet, hence Sari is called the inventor of the Shakespearean sonnet. Sari also exploited the sonnet form for an epitaph for his friend Thomas Clary and an elegy for his senior poet that is Thomas Wyatt. He was able to give new expressions in the sonnet form which is usually used for expressing love for a beloved that love is normally not reciprocated. For our purpose we have chosen two poems out of the 15 poems or sonnets that Sari has left. There are many other songs and some sonnets which are doubtful authorship. So, we have two sonnets for our discussion. The first sonnet is adapted from Petrarch's sonnet number 140, it is called Love that doth reign and live within my thought. And the second one is adapted from Petrarch's sonnet 310, which is known as the suit season the bud and bloom forth brings. Now, let us get into the poem. Love that doth reign and live within my thought and built his seat within my captive breast, clad in the arms wherein with me he fought, oft in my face he doth his banner rest, but she that taught me love and suffer pain, my doubtful hope and act my heart desire with shame faced look to shadow and refrain, her smiling grace converted straight to ire and covered love then to the heart apace, taketh his flight where he doth lurk and plain, his purpose lost and dare not show his face for my lord's guilt, thus faultless bide I pain, yet from my lord shall not my foot remove, sweet is the death that taketh end by love. Here we have the poem with the rhyme scheme, as you can see the last two lines end in a couplet, the rhyming words are remove and love. We call this rhyme I rhyme because the sound is different, but they look alike. Let us begin with a thematic analysis with a focus on contrast between two opposite ideas. In this poem we have the themes of love and death and these themes are mixed with pain and guilt. The love that lives in the heart of the lover comes out on his face and bravely shows up like a soldier in a battlefield. 
the woman who taught him love and the attendant pain becomes angry when he expresses his love without shame under cover. Perhaps the woman expect the lover to be a little more shy. Then the coward love retreats into his heart and dare not show up again because he feels defeated. The speaker suffers for the guilt of his lord but will stay with him hiding in his love. Paradoxically, the poem tells us love is sweet though it brings death. This paradoxical poem about love and death personifies love as a human being. It uses a device called conceit. The poet imagines love as a soldier his own heart as a camp and the face as a battlefield. This may be akin to the metaphysical conceit of poets like Dan who used a compass in his poem. In this poem we have an epigram that is a short pity saying summing up certain feelings or ideas. We have this example here, sweet is a death that taketh end by love. The diction used by the poet is of a specific variety that is the words have been chosen from the military vocabulary. Words like rain, captive, arms, fought, banner, flight, foot all these words together create an atmosphere of battlefield. This poem also uses alliteration quite effectively. There are many love, live, hope, heart, shame faced, shadow, smiling, straight. Quite interestingly this poem has one whole line with this assonance and built his seat within my captive breast. You can see the highlighted letter I in built his within captive. Probably the poet is trying to say that the whole idea is within his heart. Now, let us examine the rhyme, rhythm and meter of this particular sonnet. We have this rhyme scheme of A B A B C D C D. E C E C F F and the rhyming words are thought, breast, fought, rest. Within this A B A B we can see a very close connection between the words used in this particular uh, quatrain. Thought, breast, very minor uh, distinction in sound, but the poet is able to show that similar feelings coming together through the use of thought, fought and closely connected vowel breast, rest. In the second quatrain he uses words like pain, desire, refrain and ire to indicate the rhyme. In the third quatrain he has four words a pace, plain, face, pain. And the last two lines in the couplet, he has two words which we mentioned already, remove, love. They create a sense of rhythm or rhyme for the I, that is why we call it I rhyme. If we examine the rhythm of this poem, we will find it very interesting to see the different kinds of pauses in the middle and at the end and also the run on lines that the poet has used. We have indicated this comma in highlight red and we have also shown the run on line by a marker you can see on the slide. And covered love then to the heart apace taketh his flight 
where he doth lurk and plain, his purpose lost and dare not show his face. The variety in the process, in the movement of the thought process or emotion, we can very well see in these three lines. If we look at the meter, we find it interesting to see Sari has used iambic pentameter with a variation of trochee. Some more variation also it is possible for us to see in, in the first line we have used as an example. And built his seat within my captive breast is completely iambic except that one within some readers may like to consider that both uh, syllables unstressed in such a case that may be peric, but then we will consider it as I am in general. And the, when we go to the next line, we see clad in the arms wherein with me he fought, clad in is example of Truckee where the stress comes in the first word. On the whole, we have the impression of love being personified as a lord who comes out as a soldier to fight in the battle of love on the speaker's own face. When the lady, the lover in front of her, she finds the man full with full of energy that is expressing his love openly without any kind of shame. That is where the lady feels a little upset. So, she mischievously tries to be angry with the poet the speaker. Unable to receive the lady's love, the speaker or the speaker's lord that is love retreats with shame and goes into the heart of the speaker. As it go as the love goes into the heart, love suffers guilt and complains about the loss that is loss of favor from the lady. Now, the speaker endures the pain of guilt. However, the speaker commits himself to the lord of love. Then we see at the end the paradox. Love is paradoxically sweet death for the speaker. Let us discuss the second poem we have chosen for this presentation. The suit season that bud and bloom forth brings with green hath clad the hill and eck the whale. The nightingale with feathers knew she sings, the turtle to her make hath told her tale. Summer is come for every spray now springs, the heart hath hung his old head on the pale. The buck in break his winter coat he flings, the fishes float with new repaired scale. The adder all her slough away the she slings, the swift swallow pursue the fly small, the busy bee her honey now she smings. Winter is one that was the flower's bale, and thus I see among these pleasant things, each care decays, yet my sorrow springs. After the reading, now we have the rhyme scheme in this. Uh, presentation. We have also indicated the rhyme scheme through color code if red for A, green for B, A, 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 A. That is how we have identified the rhyme scheme. It is uh, peculiar the same rhyme scheme A, B, A, B and only two words change alternating rhymes we have. Brings whale, sings tail, springs pale, flings scale, slings small, mings bale, things springs. There is some beauty in this poem we will see. As we look into the thematic contrast in this poem, we can see contrast between two seasons, winter season, spring season and then summer season. Winter is associated with sadness, suffering and things like that. 
spring gives a pleasant feeling. So, these two seasons are contrasted and these two seasons share something with the poet. The poet is able to watch the movement, the change of seasons, but nothing changes in him. The winter does not, the winter of his love or the winter of his suffering does not change. That is why we find the poet saying the winter season has given way to spring. Pleasant spring is full of greenery, nightingale, turtle dove. Summer also has arrived with heart and buck, adder, fish and swallow. At this time bees also make their honey from flowers emphasizing winter has already disappeared because during winter flowers do not bloom so much. But when it comes to the poet the season remains the same, he has his sorrow all cares he has. He says every care, every sorrow, every suffering disappears, but the poet's own sorrow remains as an eternal spring or source of suffering. Now, let us examine the theme and the rhyme. Sometimes poet use rhyme so effectively to convey their theme. This poem deals with the changing season in nature and the unchanging season in the speaker. The first 12 lines alternate in rhyme A B A B. The last two lines do not change, they have the same rhyme that is A A and thus form a couplet. As you can see the contrast is quite effective. The first 12 lines we have all pleasant things and in the last two lines we have all sorrow. So, up to line 12 lines are strongly alliterative, there also we have some rhythm, rhyme, uh, smoothness, pleasantness through alliteration. And in the case of lines 13 and 14 we have just one alliteration, it is not for smoothness or harmony, but for disharmony and discord within the heart of the poet. This kind of effective use of theme and rhyme is found in some poems, this is a good example. There are many poetic devices that the poet has used. In this particular poem, we find alliteration to be very strong. Suit season, that is sweet season, suit is actually sweet. Suit season, bud and bloom, turtle told her tale, summer spray springs, heart hath hung his old head, buck in break, fishes float, slough she sl slings, swift swallows small, busy bee, winter is worn, sorrow springs. It is fantastic. Within this poem we have an example of hyperbated in lines 3 and 11. The turtle to her make hath, make his mate, told her tale, we would normally have this word order, the turtle told her tale to her mate. And in the second example, we have the busy bee, her honey now she minks. The words we have put in brackets, it would be good or it is normal to have at the end. The busy bee minks, that is mingles or collects her honey now. We also have the example of this end stopped lines and cesura in lines 5, 12 and 14. Summer is come, we have a pause for every spray now springs end stop. Winter is worn, a pause that was the flowers bale stop. Each care decays, pause and yet my sorrow springs. So, in the case of the first line that is summer is come, we have th four syllables and in the last line that is each care decays, there also we have four syllables. In between we have winter is one that also has four syllables, but you can see 
graphically some distance is shown to us to indicate variation in this different kinds of pauses. On the whole we have a good impression of this poem the sweet season is wonderful. The sweet season has arrived with the spring after winter has receded or gone away. The whole environment is green and lively full of vitality joy and this joy of nature it is conveyed to us through different kinds of animals, birds, insects which live happily from the nightingale, turtle, heart, buck, fishes, adder, sallow, bee. We have a new life for all of them. They all have taken a new lease of life in spring because the harsh winter has gone away. But the speaker alone is unhappy because his love is not reciprocated firmly by his lady love. Therefore, his own care or sorrow continues as ever without any change. Thus, the speaker contrasts his own desolate condition with that of the sprightly spring season. In such a situation, dejection is the mood of the poet and it appears to be eternal for the poet and so it lives within him or he lives with that desolate state of mind. So far, we have discussed the two poems, the sonnets of the Earl of Surrey. We saw the historical context and the literary context in which he wrote his poems as a soldier, as a poet, as a courtier. Surrey was involved in the war with France. He was also involved in the political turmoils of his time. He was suspected of treason and that is why he was beheaded. The literary context was fantastic for him because that was the beginning of 16th century. Sir Thomas Wyatt had already introduced Petrarchan sonnet into English. Surrey himself visited Italy and he was overjoyed by the dramatic output of literature in Italy and other European countries. He also returned not just returned, returned with Virgil and translated Virgil's poetry into English and some of the sonnets, some like 15 sonnets attributed to Surrey we have. We discussed two sonnets, love that doth reign and live within my thought and the suit season that bud and bloom forth brings. These two poems amply demonstrate the speaker's love for his lady. The analysis tells us love is a wonderful feeling that the poet has enjoyed though it might bring him pain, death and everything else. We have some references for you. You can if possible refer to at least the last one, the first Petrarchans, you will find a comparison between Surrey and Thomas Wyatt. Enjoy yourself.